Good morning, Strange Loop. Uh, everyone awake? Ready to talk about some neat ocean drones? Uh, real fast, I just want to echo what AJ said uh, during the opening keynote, uh, you know, and just give a huge shout out to Alex and all of the Strange Loop, Strange Loop crew. Um, I first attended here uh, in 2019 and loved it so much that I decided to come back as a presenter. So I hope that's a testament to just what a cool event this is. So um, huge shout out to them and uh, thanks for having me. All right, right, so uh, my name is Todd Belmer. Uh, this is my Twitter handle in case any of you want to see me complain at brands about their terrible products uh, or occasionally make the bad programming joke. Um, and well, what do I do? Uh, I was an early engineer at SailDrone that uh, built the initial incarnations of the systems we're going to talk about today. Um, today, I manage our fleet operations software team, um, which is a team responsible for not only these systems, but a number of other critical components of the SailDrone uh, stack and uh, just company. And so you might be asking yourself, well, gee, Todd, what is SailDrone? Uh, and I would respond with, I'm happy that you asked. Um, we build sailboats that are drones. Thank you for coming to my Todd talk. <laughs> this is so dumb. <laughs> all right. In all seriousness, SailDrone builds and operates a fleet of uncrewed surface vehicles, or USVs. The, the bulk of the fleet is composed of uh, vessels that we call explorers, um, and they feature a trick aerodynamic wing. This wing allows the explorers to sail being propelled by, by wind, um, but they can also be propelled by ocean currents as well. One of the things people are most surprised about when we talk about these things is just how big these, these vehicles actually are. They're no toys. It's not the size of that quadcopter I showed you just a moment ago. These things are 23 feet long. They're pretty large. Uh, power for the onboard systems is provided by banks of onboard batteries, um, and these batteries can be charged by solar panels on the wing and hull. Um, and additionally, they can be charged with devices called hydro generators, uh, which convert the kinetic energy of the drone moving through the water into electricity that we can store in the batteries. Those batteries are used to power the multitude of different payloads we run on board the drones. These vehicles are crammed full of sensors that can collect a variety of atmospheric data, so things like wind speed, ambient temperature, humidity, th things of that nature, ocean surface data, so things like current speed, uh, or sorry, wave height, water temperature, salinity, et cetera. And then finally, subsurface data, so current speed at a given depth, temperature at a given depth, bathymetric measurements, and fish stock tracking. Uh, we actually regularly work with different fisheries that are interested in tracking their fish stocks so we can know whether we are fishing sustainably or not. That's a pretty common mission that we, op that we run. SailDrone owns and operates the fleet of vehicles, and our mission capability is leased to our clients, with boats configured in particular ways depending on a given client's mission parameters and goals. Some of our notable clients include organizations such as the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NASA, and their European, Australian, and Japanese counterparts. SailDrones also have the ability to monitor sensitive protected marine habitats. As many of you may know, illegal fishing is a scourge of the oceans that devastates coastal communities and marine ecosystems. We at SailDrone have developed a machine learning based camera system that's capable of detecting vessels within a drone's visual range. This technology can be used for a variety of purposes, marine sanctuary enforcement being one of them, but there are also defense and law enforcement applications for this technology as well. The upshot is that sail drones can perform their science missions while, as a bonus, keeping watch for illegal activity in areas where fishing or other activities have been restricted. Sail drones are also capable of performing bathymetric surveys. So if that sounds like a nonsense phrase, uh, it's just a fancy way of saying seafloor mapping. As many of you may know, we know more about the, the surface of Mars than we know about the bottom of our own oceans. And you might ask, well, Todd, what's the big deal? It's, it's all underwater anyways. The big deal is that bathymetry data lays the foundation to many other aspects of ocean science. So safety of navigation, cable laying, wind farm planning, discovery of natural resources, and protection of fragile ecosystems. By understanding the seafloor, we can bolster our understanding of these other areas by providing detailed maps that allow researchers to determine where they want to look for potential new discoveries. To support this mission, we've built another class of drone that we call Surveyor. 
Surveyor is a 72-foot behemoth that has multiple commercial-grade echo sounders, or sonars, in the keel. It became operational earlier this year, and in fact, the image from the previous slide was composed from data that we collected on our maiden voyage from San Francisco to Hawaii and back. On that same voyage, Surveyor also encountered a previously unknown sea hill, uh, which is smaller than a sea mount, but we'll take credit for a new discovery nonetheless. To perform the missions that any of our vessels are capable of, not just Surveyor, you'd historically need a large crewed vessel of some sort that needs to go out in the middle of the ocean for months on end while it transects back and forth or holds station somewhere with dozens of people on board. Sail drones are capable of performing these same types of missions for a fraction of the cost, a fraction of the environmental impact, and that's all without anyone ever needing to leave the shore. All of our vehicles are capable of long endurance missions. They operate hundreds, if not thousands of miles uh, from shore for months on end. Drones sail a route autonomously that's chosen by human operators. Um, I don't know how many of you know anything about sailing, uh, but autonomous sailing is a pretty sophisticated system that we needed to build. The drones need to know how, to, how and when to perform certain maneuvers like tacking and jibing, uh, all without a human in the loop. The drones are capable of operating in extreme conditions, regularly operating in places like the Arctic and Southern Oceans. And if you have, were following the news, uh, also in the middle of an, in the eye of a Category 4 hurricane. Uh, this was released yesterday. And so why would we want to huck drones right in the middle of a hurricane? Um, well, if you've seen the movie Twister, that might give you a good idea <laughs> of, of why. Uh, there's, there's no substitute for collecting in situ data at the ground level in order to augment our understanding of how these systems operate. So what you're seeing on the left here is, um, in this video, is um, wind speed as shown in our mission management software. And on the right, you see the video taken from onboard that same drone um, inside the eye of the hurricane. And thankfully it stopped because that makes me a little seasick on land. Um, so going back to this slide, uh, the image on this slide is a visualization of the route taken by one of our drones in 2019. That voyage marked the first successful autonomous circumnavigation of Antarctica. And some of this data set from that mission is public, and if you're interested, you can find that at data.saildrone.com. Um, but this was a long endurance mission. This took you know, uh, the better part of six months, um, and the Southern Ocean is one of the most inhospitable places in the, in the world. That's the ocean that surrounds Antarctica. Um, and it's certainly home to some of the roughest seas. So given the distance from shore, the duration of these missions, and the exotic locales that our drones operate in, how do we manage their health and safety? Well, in the early days, we'd make use of manually checking data that we plotted in our mission management software. And while the drones are at sea, they record all manner of scientific data and telemetry. And so we send back low, low, low resolution data that's of the, on the order of one minute or longer, typically, that's sent back in near real time over satellite communications. Uh, higher resolution data than that, we store on board the drones until they come back to port so that we can offload it once, they, once they've returned home. And this approach worked okay with just a few drones on the water that don't move very quickly. We just have one or two people that would stare at these graphs for hours on end and just wait for something abnormal to happen. But this obviously doesn't scale very well when you have dozens of drones operating at any given time. So how do you solve the problem of monitoring many drones operating in many different locales, in many different environments, with many different configurations? Well, we're, we're at a software conference, so if you guess you automate it, then I'm going to give you a gold star. Enter Sonar, a stream processing engine for telemetry. Uh, sonar was a way more clever name for this, by the way, before we started doing a lot of work in the bathymetry space where we're using actual sonars to, to take measurements of things, but I, I digress. Sonar consumes real-time telemetry from Jones and performs various analyses on it. It highlights any potential issues, alerts fleet operators or engineers, and handles the, the issue management lifecycle. Sonar will wait to receive new data from drones that corrects a failure condition and then closes out issues appropriately. To summarize, it's, a, it's just a monitoring and alerting system for drones. So let's talk about the technical bits here. Uh, moving in the clockwise direction, uh, Sonar is written in TypeScript and runs in, on Node.js. Uh, 
it uses Redis heavily. We actually maintain a hot cache of time series data inside this hot cache so that Sonar doesn't need to have any external dependencies on our primary time series store. This keeps it isolated in the event of upstream issues with, with those services so that we have a mission critical service that can always run and is not dependent on anything else. We use Postgres as our primary persistent data store for things that we need to store other than time series data. Uh, we use AWS SQS for, uh, for queuing drone telemetry. It's running on Kubernetes and Docker. And you might note, there's nothing terribly exotic here. This, these are all pretty standard, well understood technologies. And that's the power of this system, in my opinion. It enables new engineers to come in and make new additions very quickly, uh, even if they don't understand the, the, the system entirely. Um, using tools and, tools and languages and systems that they're likely already familiar with from previous experience. So Sonar consists of a number of different pieces of logic we call checks. And these checks form the basis of the monitoring system in Sonar and contain the core logic for executing analysis on different pieces of data. So check types include simple event-driven checks like a threshold check to make sure that data is under or over some min or max value, uh, a simple comparison check like equality or inequality to make sure that something like a sensor has turned on or off when we expect it to have been. In rate of change checks, we can perform a simple statistical analysis on time series data to see whether the set of values is increasing or decreasing too rapidly or too slowly. We might use this for something like inspecting the state of batteries to make sure that the state of, the state of charge isn't uh, degrading too quickly or too slowly. Uh, there are more complicated event-driven checks that we use for vehicle navigation, specifically checking to see if a vehicle is out of its corridor or not. When we send a route to a drone, we typically provide it with um, a boundary radius that provides a, a corridor that the drone can sail in as it tacks and back and forth trying to sail the route. Um, and you know, if that drone leaves that, leaves that boundary for some reason, we want to know about that. It could be indicative of problems on the vehicle or just poor conditions. Uh, these types of checks also include other types of geofencing checks that ensure a drone either stays in a given area or doesn't stray into another. Um, and if a dro drone steps outside of its corridor or its geofence, it could be indicative of uh, light wind or current. So it's important for us to let operators know if we are just simply unable to sail in those current conditions. Uh, we have a class of check called downstream checks. We'll come back to those in a moment. And finally, we have scheduled checks. All these checks are predominantly event-driven, meaning that they're predicated on the system having received some telemetry from a drone. But if we don't receive any, any data from a drone, that's also a problem, right? So we have different checks that can operate on a cron to check things like whether we've received any data from a drone and alert if, that is, if, if we haven't seen anything from a drone in a given time period. All right, so I promise we get back to downstream checks. Downstream checks are other logical checks that are written and executed outside of the core sonar service. Why might we want that? Sometimes we might want to take advantage of a library that's not available in JavaScript, or a developer from another team might not know much TypeScript, uh, but they can crank something out in Python really fast. Or we might want to do some sort of analysis on time series data going back further than what Sonar's hot cache can provide. So we'll call out to our actual time series data store. Um, it, there are a multitude of reasons that you might want to do, do this and take advantage of this system. So enabling developers to spin up isolated checks and configure Sonar to trigger them has enabled developers to quickly and easily add new functionality to our alerting systems, all without the need to touch the core service at all unless they want to. So how does it work? The downstream check exposes a webhook or a message queue that Sonar can use to delegate check execution. Hitting that webhook or dropping a message on the queue triggers the downstream check and it performs this analysis. Uh, Sonar will sometimes send data to that check that the check will perform its analysis on or that check may call out to some other system or service to get the data it needs to perform its analysis. Once the check is complete, it calls back to the main Sonar service to report the result of its execution. If the check is executed successfully, everything, everything's good. We move on with life. Uh, but if the check has failed, Sonar will handle the issue management lifecycle as it normally would for any other type of check. With this in mind, Sonar isn't just a simple monitoring and alerting service. It's an entire monitoring and alerting ecosystem that we've built. 
we've added a number of different check types to this ecosystem using this methodology, including checks that determine if a drone is too close to shore. That's a check, that's a function that's written in Go, that operates entirely outside of the, out of the core service. Um, we might want to determine whether a sensor has stopped working properly. That's another function that's written in Python. Um, all of these things can execute outside the main sonar service um, in languages of a developer's choice without them needing to, needing to touch sonar at all. All right, so here's an abridged look at how sonar checks operate. And before I dive into it, it's worth just mentioning that the same set of checks might not apply to all drones or even to the same drone for a different message it receives. Um, it's, this is indicative of a specific message received, uh, received from a drone at a specific time, and the content of that message can vary from transmission to transmission. So in the beginning, there is a message queue, and it is good. Uh, this queue is responsible for shuttling telemetry data from drones back into sonar. Sonar picks up the message and puts it through a, through a message handler inside of itself. This message handler checks to make sure that the data we've received is indeed something Sonar actually cares about, otherwise we just discard it immediately. It then checks to see what vehicle data, what vehicle the data uh, is, has been received for and whether checks are enabled for that vehicle. If the vehicle is set up to have checks performed, the message handler then pulls out all the variables in that message, there can be a number of them, uh, determines which checks need to be run based on the vehicle and uh, the variables that we've pulled out, and then finally executes all of those checks. Uh, and so that's what you see in the, in the right-hand column there. And in the case that a downstream check needs to be performed, Sonar calls out to that check, the check executes, and then it reports its results back to Sonar. Um, so finally, in that upper left-hand corner, we have one of our scheduled checks just executing all on its own in isolation, checking to see whether we've received any messages from a drone or not. So in the previous slide, we looked at how logical checks get executed inside of Sonar, but how do we map individual pieces of telemetry to different logical check types? Well, we store that check configuration inside of Sonar's database, that, that, po that Postgres instance that I mentioned earlier. This configuration is responsible for tying an individual telemetry element to a specific logical check and is selected when we receive relevant telemetry from a drone. By default, all checks execute at a global level, uh, but they can be overridden on a vehicle-by-vehicle -vehicle basis. So in this example we have here in this form, uh, we're configuring a threshold check for a drone's baseboard temperature. And if a drone's baseboard temperature gets too hot or too cold, uh, its performance could be impacted in all sorts of bad ways or something worse could happen. So we want to know when we're approaching, when, we want to know when it's approaching its thermal limits. You can see that we've configured a min and max value for the, check to, for the check to execute against, and in this case, it's temperatures and degrees Celsius. Um, we can specify a failure message that will show up in the issue description should the check fail, um, and you can see that there are some variables in it. These, me these messages can be dynamically uh, constructed with relevant information to fleet operators or engineers. Uh, we can additionally uh, specify a URI, URI for a playbook, um, that will show up in the incident description uh, should the check fail. This documentation is super useful for our mission managers or other engineers to potentially quickly identify and resolve common issues so folks don't need to unravel what a given incident message means um, or have muscle memory from a previous time that they, that they had to resolve that issue. Uh, they just can reference the documentation and they're good to go. Um, our drones have different operation modes that have different devices powered and configured based on what mode the vehicle is in. So we can provide overrides based on the specific operation mode of a drone is in. So uh, we might you know, want to check for the power state of a certain sensor in one mode and not care about it at all in a different mode. Uh, similarly, we can specify what vehicle generation we want a given check to apply to. And this allows us to create different checks for surveyor class vehicles, for explorer class vehicles, or in the case that it's blank like it is here, uh, it just executes on all class of vehicle. Uh, we can optionally uh, set up allowed sequential failures, which tell a check that it needs to fail a certain number of times before we actually trigger an incident. And wh why would we want this? Wouldn't we want to know when anything is failing? Well, you know, we deal with hardware that doesn't always behave the way that we think it should in software land. Um, a single failure triggered by a specific hardware quirk isn't always enough to raise the alarm, but sequential failures should be. 
So we allow engineers or mission managers to make their own calls uh, on how and when we alert for particular issues. Additionally, all checks have a severity level associated with them, and those severity levels can be staggered. So uh, in this instance, we're configuring a medium severity alert for, um, for baseboard temperature, but in the event that we wanted to have staggered alerts for, you want to trigger a warning level when it exceeds some threshold, but then you want to trigger a page uh, when it exceeds a different one, you can set the various severity levels there and have them uh, kind of stagger them that way. Certain drones have redundant baseboards, so target CPU in this form simply differentiates between which baseboards telemetry we should use to execute a check on. Um, in this case, we're just executing against both computers. The period of day setting allows us to specify whether we want a check to execute during daylight, nighttime, or, or both times. Um, as you can imagine, payloads and power states could be drastically different during nighttime versus daytime when we're not generating any solar power. Um, so it doesn't make sense to necessarily run the same checks uh, at night as we would during the day. So um, we, can, we can hone in on that a little bit. Um, this, the setting allows us to override checks to account for those differences. And finally, we can specify a number of pager duty settings, though these only apply to high severity checks. And in the case that a check should trigger a pager duty alert, we allow the check to specify which, excuse me, which group it should alert. So uh, we have a number of different groups here, um, some of which go to our mission managers and some of which go to software engineers based on the context of what we're checking and what, and what check. And so as you can see, we've built a number of knobs that we can tweak on, on each check, which allows a great deal of flexibility when creating and modifying check configurations. So what happens if a check fails? In that event, we create what we call an incident. Incidents persist until Sonar receives data from a drone that clears the failure condition in a subsequent check run. Incidents appear in our internal tools for easy tracking, and we'll get broadcast in drone-specific Slack channels. Slack is actually a really handy tool here. And I mean, for your purposes, it could be any chat application, but we use Slack. And we practice a form of chat ops here, rallying folks around issues that require collaboration to resolve in a semi-public channel that other people can, can participate in. And this has the added benefit of allowing folks not directly involved in the mitigation process to learn through osmosis as the folks that are working on it uh, work through the issues in real time and in that semi-public forum. It allows people to, you know, that aren't directly involved in the process to really understand what the crux of the issue is and how they might solve it if they're in their shoes in the future. But finally, incidents can also trigger pages via PagerDuty, as we, as we mentioned a moment ago. Using the example of the baseboard temperature check from the previous slide, we see that same check failing in both the UI on the top and in a Slack message at the bottom there. Uh, Sonar has a REST API, and so while Sonar is not primarily a web service, we did bolt one of those onto it. Uh, this API is super handy. It allows us to do a number of, of, a number of things, namely performing CRUD operations on check configurations from our internal to tools. It allows uh, read operations on incidents for viewing uh, and visualization in those same tools. Uh, and those downstream checks we're so fond of, the REST API there provides a callback webhook that those downstream checks can then send their check results back to. So let's tie it all together using our baseboard temperature check example. Uh, a drone will send telemetry about its baseboard temperature back to sail drone systems. In this case, the baseboard's overheating, so uh, we, you know, we'll see that in the telemetry that we receive from it. The data will eventually work its way into sonar after it enters our systems. Sonar detects the baseboard temperature variable in the telemetry, selects the appropriate checks, and it's worth mentioning that there can be multiple checks for a single variable, uh, and then executes them, and then executes them. Uh, the threshold check we've configured fails, triggering an incident. That incident sends a message to a Slack channel, appears in our web UIs, and pages an on-call mission manager uh, to investigate the issue. Sales and personnel work to get the issue under control, potentially escalating it to internal teams to figure out what the core issue is. They resolve the underlying issue uh, on the drone, and baseboard temperature drops back down. The drone will send a new set of telemetry with data that indicates the issue is resolved. Sonar will then receive that telemetry, rerun its checks, and closes the open incident as the issue is no longer occurring. Okay, so how about some additional non-trivial examples of how this system is important to us? 
for one, we can use this system for power alerting. So suppose a drone isn't generating enough solar power because it's cloudy out. It's a, it's a real issue. We can alert a pilot so they can decide which non-critical payloads to turn down or turn off so we don't completely drain our batteries in this scenario. We can also use the system for alerting on payload status. When performing bathymetric surveys with Surveyor, for instance, we'll frequently need to cast a sound velocity profiler device off of the vehicle. This device allows us to collect data about how sound moves in different areas of the ocean so that we can use it to calibrate uh, the echo sounders on the vehicle to make sure that we are returning the most appropriate and accurate data about the seafloor as possible. Uh, the data retrieved by this device uh, can, you know, like I said, it really enable, if we, don't get it, if we don't get it right, then it'll really mess up our measurements. So it's important that we get it. So making sure that that device wakes up, gets cast, takes its measurement, and then goes back to sleep when it's all done is actually really important. So we can use the system to check for things like that. Finally, we can use this system for alerting as part of our drone readiness process. And as you can imagine, there's a whole phase of drone construction between when a drone is fully mechanically and electrically assembled uh, and when it can actually be put on the water. And this phase includes the performance of tasks like installing software, installing firmware, checking out sensor payloads, um, validating data looks like it's in reasonable ranges and things like that. We call this phase our readiness phase and sonar plays an important part in it. For instance, we frequently ship our drones to far off locales for deployment so they don't have to sail all the way to their mission sites. When a drone is put in a shipping container, it will be deemed 100% operational by our, by our staff and ready for deployment. But perhaps in transit, a sensor got jostled loose uh, or broken. And in that case, when the drone is reassembled and brought online at its remote deployment site, sonar will alert us to the problem and allow us to address the issue before the drone is even deployed. All right, so how about some numbers? We have over 900 checks configured for over 350 different variables, and we've run these checks over 100 million times. There, are, there have been thousands of issues resolved over the course of hundreds of drone missions. So that's cool and all, but so what? Uh, the upshot is the system has had some real tangible benefits for us. It allows mission managers to simultaneously manage multiple drones without needing to stare at mind-numbing data and graphs for hours on end. It's, freed the, it's also freed up those same mission managers to focus on other aspects of their roles, like managing the relationship with and the needs of our science partners. It's alerted us to potential issues with drones while they're still in the factory, averting problems while, they're, while we're at sea. It gives us extensible and flexible management of checks in the cloud instead of on vehicle, allowing us to adjust checks on the fly and without needing to push anything new to the vehicles it's themselves. And you know, over the year updates are a capability that we have, but they're hard to do. And we prefer to be safe and manage those in the cloud where possible. And that's exactly what this system uh, enables. And finally, Sonar has given us valuable and measurable insights into the strengths and weaknesses in our systems and designs, and it's allowed us to really improve and iterate upon those over time. It's played a really instrumental part in, in that phase of our development. So, SailDrone is successful and growing, but as we've grown, we've needed to create new solutions to help us scale. So, if these types of problems are interesting to you, we're hiring. And uh, there are actually three of us here this, this week uh, so if you have questions about SailDrone or interested in talking more about that, then please come, come uh, seek us out. And with that, I should have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, they're not small. So the question was, how are we adhering to uh, you know, basic navigation laws and obstacle avoidance, correct? Yeah, so um, our pilots are really, are really good at that, and in our piloting software, which is also pretty sophisticated, I didn't show any screenshots of it, but we have a sophisticated piloting system that allows our drone operators to see where obstacles are using uh, you know, publicly available charts. Um, and so they take those different obstacles into account um, when piloting the drones. We also get real-time AIS data in our systems, that's automatic identification, identification system. Uh, data that are basically transponders for ships. Um, so we can, use, we can use those to factor in navigating around uh, other vessels uh, while we're in crowded lanes. Um, does that answer your question? Sure. The question is, what's the biggest takeaway, technical or non-technical? Yeah, if, we yeah, if, we, if we're gonna do it again, would we do something different? Um, I'm not certain. 
to be honest with you. Um, I think we're pretty happy with the system overall. It has really, like I said, enabled us to have an entirely new class of capabilities on the drones that wouldn't have been, uh, wouldn't have been available beforehand. There's possible that there might have been some other technical choices we would have made, um, you know, given where we're at now, and we may revisit those. Um, but for where we were at the time when we first created the system, it was exactly what we needed. So the question is, uh, how do we do version management for different types of drones and um, for different types of missions? Is that correct? Yeah, so we have a, we have a release, uh, a software release process that we abide by and a release candidate process and, and all of that. So we perform C trials with the drones before, they're, before you prepare to put them out on actual customer missions. Um, and that is really the validation process for, for that. Does that answer your question? Great. Question is, is capsizing a problem for the sail drones? Um, no, not, not really. Um, they have about, you know, uh, a, a lot of lead in their keels that prevents them from uh, overturning or um, capsizing. So no, not, not really a problem for them. Sure, so the question is, if I understood you correctly, is um, why did we build our own time series database uh, when there are so many uh, different uh, uh, options available? Um, it partially has, um, a bit to do with the shape of our data, um, but you know we, we've we've also are in the process of completely reworking that to use more commercially available systems. So I don't think I can get more uh, detailed than that. But um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. The yeah, sure. The question is, what's our process for adding a new check and tuning it and deciding whether it's a good check? Um, the process is really we identify a need uh, for a check. And we just go ahead and create that check, whether it's, you know, depending on what we're trying to check, it'll be one of those logical check types. Um, and, you know, we probably start kind of on the conservative side in terms of what we're trying to check, and then we adjust really if it's just becoming too noisy or, you know, someone with more knowledge about what we're actually checking there comes in and says, this was totally arbitrary, why'd you do it like that? Um, so that's, that's really the process. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, the question was um, uh, about PagerDuty and whether there are any other kind of incident response type tools that we've, that we've looped into this process. Um, no, what, what you see in the presentation is, is what we've got. It's you know, pri primarily Slack, web UIs, and, and PagerDuty where, where necessary. What can we do to solve problems when we get paged? Yeah, so I mean, it, <laughs> it really depends on what the actual issue is. Um, you know, we have remote debugging capabilities that we can use to kind of inspect what's happening on the drone. Um, and in, in that case, it really depends on what the underlying issue is. Um, when we're in the shop, we have a little more latitude for that. But again, it's, it's highly contextual. Yeah, I mean, if, so, sorry, the question is, um, if the boat just stops sending us telemetry and there's you know, no remediation process for that, what do, what do we do? Um, yeah, I mean, at that point, we're, we'd be kind of hosed if that, if that happened. Uh, um, you know, thankfully, that hasn't, so. Yeah. Any other questions? Great. Okay, well thank you so much everyone, it was a pleasure.